So there's, uh, there's always a queue behind an espresso machine uh, that'll teach us to bring one in. 
Um, but if I can encourage you, if you uh, are uh, one of the invited guests who has a name tag, if you could make your way to the seats. Uh, it may be uh, we have more people than we have seats, which is a delight. Uh, but it also means there may be one or two vacant seats. So if you're perched around the outside, then uh, as it becomes clear that a seat is vacant, then do please uh, fill uh, that uh, space. As I say, we will start in uh, just a minute or so when the last few people have been able to uh, take their seats. Okay, so if I could uh, introduce myself, my name is uh, Peter Woodward, uh, I'm uh, based from the UK, I'm an independent uh, facilitator, um, uh, my passion is around the agenda for sustainable development, uh, circular economy is one of those crucial turnkey opportunities for us to forge a whole new way that we achieve quality of life for so many in a way that is resource efficient and gentle on our planet. It's an, an amazing uh, agenda and it's a privilege for me as uh, to be moderating a conversation really looking around the focus of uh, innovation in particular as a driver of an enabler of that transition. My role this afternoon is really to enable a productive, thoughtful, challenging discussion that will move us forward. It's great to be joined on a webcast by people from around uh, the globe. We hope you find this a satisfying experience. As ever, we have much to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, and what I'd like to do right at the outset uh, is to invite our uh, co-hosts of this particular meeting uh, to give a welcome. So please, if I can... Uh, give the floor to Mr. Bart uh, van der Vetter, who's uh, uh, Nestlé's Head of Corporate Communication and Government Relations. I think Europe, Middle East, North Africa, that's quite a lot uh, enough to be getting on with. Um, so uh, uh, if you'd like to say a few words, where are we? Ah, oh, you're on this side. Welcome. Thank you and, and welcome um, to everybody on the, on the, the side from, from Nestlé and Nespresso. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome as well to the host uh, and thanks for uh, hosting it and all the MEPs and, and colleagues uh, here around the table. Just one minute why we have been uh, got getting this idea to organize this event uh, today. It's because uh, Nestle has set itself an ambition for 2030 to have zero environmental impact huh, by 2030. So it means that today this is an ambition. We are not sure that we are getting there. With the means of today, we will not get there. But what we are sure of is that we are taking steps and very concrete steps with you as well. Huh? There are two aspects to our ambition. There is first of all the aspect of our own in, uh, operations, our own factories, for example, where we are, of course, reducing water, CO2, uh, zero waste factories. For example, by 2020 already, we will have all our factories in Europe zero waste. Uh, we have now already 70, 75, and we have more than 100 um, in Europe. So we are progressing a lot there, which uh, on things that is fully under our control. The real point, and that is the point of today, is actually how we get also to this zero environmental impact beyond the Nestle scope, direct scope. And that is the real point that we need to address. And we have uh, got the pleasure to, to have the Nespresso colleagues here today who are in our company, certainly also a lighthouse on that. A lighthouse also because they are working a lot with the, all of the society. And that is very important, that's also why um, the startups 
have been uh, invited because a lot of work is happening there. Also with the policy makers, we need a lot of collaboration with all of you. And that's uh, our, uh, our ambition for today. And step by step, we should then achieve our 2030 ambition uh, and the ambition for the circular economy. Bob, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this afternoon splits into two halves. We are going to be opening up uh, a high-level discussion around some of those key issues of really how that innovation entrepreneurial drive is part of a transformation to a circular economy. We hope to be inspired and enlightened by six innovators in this room. And just to mention at this stage, uh, we've got six innovators who've agreed to come along and just do an extraordinary two-minute sell the sizzle pitch to us. And just to add a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, oil into the pan, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to vote for which one of the six uh, you feel is one of the most exciting uh, opportunities around circular economy, which maybe offers the best potential for value and scaling and is a real communication opportunity for transformation. So rather than think these six innovators are here, um, uh, just for you to uh, enjoy your lunch through, you are the judging panel. So uh, be prepared at the end to think which one of those most grabs my intention, attention as a game changer. Each of them is going to be introduced by uh, one of our uh, MEP guests and we're delighted. We know this is a crazy last week before the plenaries of the, uh, of the Parliament. Uh, that you've found a little bit of time out of your schedules just to be with us and we, we, we thank you so much for your time and you're each in a sense a host uh, to one of the innovations and you'll introduce them before they do their two minute pitch and what I'd like to do uh, right at the outset is to come to our first uh, host but who is also the host of this meeting uh, here at the European Parliament um, so I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Davo Skelec, uh, MEP from uh, Croatia, to offer a few words of, of welcome and an introduction. Thank you, Peter. Uh, first, I uh, welcome our startups, uh, the major uh, uh, part of uh, our today events, and uh, welcome uh, our, uh, my fellow MEPs, colleagues from the European Parliament, which will take contribution in this, during the discussion representing the, the, the startups. Uh, just a few words at the beginning, uh, so the most important word in this uh, event is innovation. Innovation is a major pillar of our um, major EU policies and the circular economy is one of these policies. And we need to invest more in innovation because if you look at, at uh, Eurostat, in our statistics, we are not so good in innovations. We are declining. We are declining. Uh, comparison to the compared to the rest of the world, especially Chinese and some other uh, other countries, which are more competitive to us in, in this field. So we must invest more in innovation. We must support our companies. We must support our startups because they are source of uh, innovation in our future. So the first uh, startup which we'll uh, represent today is uh, from the France. Uh, I pass the floor to the Pangloss Labs to uh, represent uh, how they contribute to the EU innovation arena. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And you'll need to speak from there so we can hear you in the microphone. Uh, it's a slight change of plan, but that's what, so it's about disruption. That's what <laughs> circular economy is all around. Okay, so your two minutes starts now if you push the button. So, Pangloss Labs is a collaborative shared space for local innovation. We built an interesting place to attract interesting people to do interesting things, a do tank more than a think tank. With multiple innovation labs built around an ecological fab lab, we're trying to bring a 21st century version of local manufacturing back to Europe. But our product is local businesses. So our approach mixes open innovation, digital fabrication, local sourcing, and circular design with Lean Startup, a very practical, can you get customers to pay for this methodology? Our motivation comes from two key ideas. Number one, we aren't going to save the planet in our spare time. And number two, if the only jobs available are ecologically destructive, that's what people will do. And we were excited by the Internet of Things. We already have the Internet, so we needed somewhere to make the things. 
working directly with new and existing businesses and their customers using design thinking. We've identified waste material flows, waste, which can be used for new products. We put processes in place for direct recycling of 3D prints, plastic, wood, plus repair and modular design of electronics and robotics. An example, this bracelet here is made of 3D printed wood, printed in our fab lab, with the filament being made from the sawdust of a local ski maker, one that we also designed and built the modular laser engraver so he can brand his skis in his workshop. From day one, we knew that the interactions between different disciplines were key to creating innovation, but none of the traditional startup support network seemed to understand this. Focus, they'd say. Nobody would fund us, so we bootstrapped the whole thing ourselves without support. Being on the border with Switzerland, I can tell you that the EU customs regulations are light years away from being ready for local small-scale production. We can build a custom product for less than the cost of the paperwork. So far, we've helped more than 100 local entrepreneurs. To scale up across Europe, simply replicate this in different places. And let's make it so easy for our small businesses to adopt the circular economy that it becomes the default. Thank you very much indeed. I think that deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> so that incubation, that clustering, that getting a great ideas collaboration together is that part of the way forward, uh, how, do, how much does that excite you? We're going to come to our second uh, uh, innovation, uh, introduced, I think, by MEP Seb Dance. Seb, are you, are you with us? Okay. Fantastic. Uh, MEP for London, great to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Someone's made the point about the circular table already, right? That's, that's yeah. been done. Okay, great. <laughs> You're Thank the you. first. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure I am. Um, th it's, it's given me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, a concept from an artist, uh, Brody Neal. Uh, Samira Hanif will be uh, presenting the concept. Um, you, 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 I think, would have had to have been in a, a cave for the last few years not to be aware of the huge issue that there is with ocean plastics. There are a number of really high-profile campaigns raising this issue. Of course, we know now that not just the water we drink, the food that we eat, but actually also the air that we breathe is contaminated with millions and millions of particles from the plastic that we use in everyday uh, consumption. Of course, single-use plastics being the number one uh, cause. Uh, Brody uh, Neal has worked on recycling ocean plastic to produce a whole new furniture range. Uh, and indeed has installed this uh, in uh, a Fosters and Partners designed at Me Hotel as part of this year's London Design Festival. It's called Drop in the Ocean. Uh, he's designed a basin-like coffee table made from recycled ocean plastic. Uh, he says, I want to make people reflect on their use of single-use plastics, make them more aware of their footprint. There are 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean. So this is a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of the problem, but every bit counts. He's developed a new material called Ocean Terrazzo. Uh, it's made in the same way as regular terrazzo, uh, but we're using chips of marble or, uh, instead of using chips of marble or granite, uh, Neil has set hundreds and hundreds of tiny pieces of plastic into a resin surface. Uh, and a new furniture collection called Flotsam also includes a bench with an ocean plastic surface. Uh, I love the way that the name of the origin of the product is incorporated into the brand name. because There's no hiding or escaping from where uh, the stuff comes from. And I think that's a key uh, bit of uh, not just raising awareness, but getting us all to confront uh, how we uh, consume modern products. So I hope I've given an overview. Samir, it's a real pleasure to have you here, and we're really excited by, uh, by what you've got to present to us today. Thank you, sir. That was a great introduction, and I don't have a huge amount more to add to that now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> great. Our next one is... Yes. <laughs> um, so I will be focusing on, as you said, we are surrounded by plastic, fragments of plastic, and all elements of our life. I will be focusing more around um, plastic in our oceans. Um, Eight million tonnes of plastic find its way into our oceans every year. Most of it, as you as I've just mentioned, is single-use plastics. So things like plastic forks, um, plastic cotton buds, water bottles. Um, and due to the ocean currents, the plastic fragments will travel from one end of the world to another, often finding their way onto beaches and coastlines, which were once pristine, but now are completely littered with ocean, ocean plastic. Um, meanwhile, the, the effect on ocean life and coastal birds is also profound. Um, by 2025, there will be more plastic in our oceans than fish, so clearly we need to take a 
action and we need to do it fairly quickly. Um, and the most, the most foremost solution for us is obviously to reduce our use of single-use plastic, but we also need to do something about all the plastic that we've already produced and is now discarded in our oceans. Um, as a design studio, we have been exploring ocean plastic not as a waste, but as a material resource and created a, a new material called Ocean Toronto, which collects ocean fragments from coastlines across the world and reconstitutes it into a new composite material. I've got a sample here, and Hannah's got a couple as well of both the plastic fragments and the, and the terrazzo. Um, and the reason the terrazzo approach was adopted is because the age and chemical makeup of plastic fragments is impossible to know once they're in, in the ocean. So the best way to um, bring it all together is through a terrazzo, a terrazzo approach. Um, Seth mentioned the gyro table, but I've got an image here of it here. It's 1.8 in diameter and was presented at the London Design Biennale a couple of years ago. This table alone includes over half a million fragments of ocean plastic waste. The, the table, as you can see, is in hues of blues and blacks and white, and not only because these are the colors that best reflect the ocean-like haze, but these are the colors that are most abundant in our oceans because the warmer tones of reds, oranges, and um, yellows are consumed by ocean, ocean life. Um, the flotsam bench, this is a model, scale down model of it, is cast as a one piece and is more reflective of the ocean as we would see in the ocean. Um, really the purpose of creating this material is to elevate the value of plastic. We think of it as throw away, it has very little value attached to it. And by bringing design, an element of design to it, we hope to make it desirable and to elevate, elevate that um, and elevate the perception of recycling plastic. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So not only is it very practical and uh, desirable uh, products, but maybe raising awareness about one of the great uh, issues that has been unsung for so many years, is, but it's now becoming part of uh, global consciousness. So there we are, two extraordinary projects. Uh, we're on to our third now, and uh, we're going into the world of food, huge issue around food waste. And to uh, introduce our next uh, project, uh, delighted to welcome uh, Mary uh, McGuinness, uh, uh, MEP, uh, background in agriculture. So I think you, this will be close to your heart, but great to have you with us. Well, thank you. And first, a declaration. I'm really a, a chancer in the room because EU40, I don't qualify. Uh, <laughs> but I'm here with good purpose. We'll uh, take your word for that. <laughs> We Irish are great storytellers, and I want to tell you uh, a story about this, and we make connections. So Food Cloud was developed by two women, Isolt Ward and Avian O'Brien, and the story around this is that Avian's grandmother taught me at school. So when I heard about Food Cloud, I made the instant connection. And what's interesting is that that lady is thankfully alive, quite elderly in her 90s, she wouldn't have talked about a circular economy. She would have said, as they did in the 1500s onwards, willful waste makes woeful want. Or as it developed into the 1700s, waste not, want not. And that is, in essence, what Emma Walsh, um, the chief executive officer of Food Cloud, will tell you about shortly. This is a fantastic project, because it sounds like a nice idea, but it's a business. It provides a service. The volume of food it has uh, distributed from businesses to those who would need food is over 8,000 tonnes, or more than 18 million meals. And this could have been put into landfill, but it's actually been put into good use. It's being consumed. I was astonished when I heard that this company employs 30 people and works with 2,000 businesses in Ireland and the United Kingdom. In Ireland, unfortunately, one in eight people experience food poverty. One million tonnes of food is thrown out by Irish consumers and business every year. And around 88 million tonnes of food are wasted annually in the European Union. Recycling and ending food waste is an absolute priority. And you know what? Before we thought about it, Food Cloud were doing it. So I can say no more. This is a great story with fantastic connections. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you very much for the great introduction. So 30% of food is wasted globally, and every year we use land the size of China, Mongolia, and Kazakhstan to grow food that's never eaten. Food waste costs us over a trillion dollars annually and contributes to 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. Meanwhile, there are 800 million people in the world who don't have enough to eat. Food Cloud's vision is for a world where no good food goes to waste. We very simply connect businesses that have surplus food to charities that can use the food using technology. We have a smartphone application and donors or supermarkets can put in details of the food that they have available to donate on an evening. This sends a notification to a local charity who will go directly to the supermarket in their community and pick up the food. Food, I, sorry. We connect 3,200 supermarkets to 7,000 charities across the UK and Ireland. And we redistribute over 1 million meals every month. We charge the supermarkets a price per store so that we become a sustainable social enterprise. And to date, we've um, redistributed in excess of 20 million meals that would otherwise have been thrown in the bin. We have faced a lot of challenges in developing the solution, and we've put the supermarkets and the charities at the center of what we do. We've spent a lot of time hanging around the bins at the back of the store. We've spent a lot of time with our charity partners to make sure that it's really, really simple to donate food and simple to pick it up. Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 challenges us all to achieve a 50% reduction in food waste by 2030. We believe our solution can play a huge part in the achievement of this goal, and we have big ambitions to bring our solution and our technology to new countries both across Europe and internationally. We'd, we want to make a huge difference to food waste, and we believe that we can, by bringing on five more countries to our platform that we can redistribute 40 million meals annually. Please help us to create a world where no good food goes to waste. We see the powerful of a uh, marriage of social, economic, and environmental imperatives in that uh, particular project. So, three down. If you're trying to track and think which one is best in your pack, you've got this small thing with a number of colours. You'll be voting on the one that you think most grabs you. So, you can use that as a reference point. We're going to drive relentlessly on to another world. Let's go to Italy next. If it's Italy, maybe it's something related to wine production and maybe uh, waste from wine production, who knows? But maybe one person who does is MEP uh, Giovanni Lavia. Thank you very much. And uh, as an Italian MEP, I'm going to present the innovation coming from an Italian startup. But before, I want to underline that all the agricultural process had uh, some waste as a result. But uh, if we are able to use this kind of waste for producing something of more important, something with added value, we are going to have a win-win operation. And for this reason, I'm going to present uh, the innovation coming from uh, Vegea, that is an Italian startup entrepreneur, uh, that are coming from Milan. And uh, in Milan, uh, Milan is the capital of fashion. And uh, we want to merge fashion, one Italian uh, spectacular tradition with, from the other side, the love and compassion of Italian uh, food and wine. And then we merge together fashion and wine in a new, beautiful innovation. This is the reason for which I'm going to give the floor to Francesco Merlino for explaining better than me the innovation and for giving to you what we can do with a waste coming from a wine process and uh, what we can do with the new technologies that is and that are the future of our common European Union. Please. Thanks. Vegea is a biomaterial created from wine, a sustainable alternative to leather and synthetic materials for fashion, furniture, and automotive application. It is obtained from processing oil and lignin cellulose contained in grape muck, a vegetal raw material made grape skins and seeds. The two things that remain after pressing grapes during wine production. The fashion industry is one of the most polluting sectors 
worldwide with a very high environmental impact. We use patented treatment on the desiccated grape mark and obtain a mixture that is then coated and, to, and transformed into VGA fabrics. With our finishing touch, we can give VGA different color, texture, and levels of thickness. VGA has created a new model of circular economy. From 26 billion liters of wine produced worldwide, we can get 2.6 billion square meters of VGA every year. The animal and synthetic leather market is worth more than 100 billion euro. And with VGA, we are going to cover the increasing demand for green and animal-free products. VGA is the new made in Italy combining <coughs> great Italian excellencies, such as fashion and wine. Thank you everyone for having attended this presentation. Fantastic. Uh, poetry in some of these. And just to say, I am available to wear any samples at all the facilitations on circular economy in 2018, uh, provided they fit. So there we are. Goodness me. Using a waste product, product to create something of value, uh, jobs, employment, so many facets uh, that we're seeing here of that closing the loop of the circular economy. What have we got in store next? Well, uh, next, our fifth one, it would be uh, only appropriate, as we are uh, supported, hosted in this conversation by Nespresso, to have a coffee-related innovation. And I, something, I can smell something which suggests that from Spain we have such an example. And if I could invite uh, Mrs. Immaculada Rodriguez to uh, introduce our next innovation. Okay. Good morning. Welcome you everybody to our European Parliament and the first thing I, like to, I want to say is that I, I am very proud of all of you. I never could imagine what are you able to do defending circular economy with innovative things. And I would like to thank very much my colleagues Deborah and Simona for all the organization of this event. It's a pleasure for me to introduce the next startup. And I am especially proud because this young startup, but I, I, I am sure he will be a long, long way, uh, comes from my region, from Valencia. I have been recently in Costa Rica, uh, where I visited a coffee plantation, and I was really surprised, really astonished, when I discovered how it can be made coming from ground coffee into a product you would be the possibility to see very, very soon. Um, the Café is the startup and is the, a very, very good example of how circular economy can be really involved in every day of our lives. The Café taking advantage of everyday waste and through an artisanal process based on culinary techniques, Raul Lauri turns the used coffee grounds into amazing products. Please, Raul, introduce your product, your startup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manila. Uh, what Just need to push the button. <laughs> what do you usually do with coffee grounds after having a cup of coffee? What if I tell you that coffee grounds can be transformed into products? In the cafe, we give them a second life in the shape of lamps, home accessories, ties, and so on. Here you have some samples. Our products are made through an artisanal and ecological process, where only natural materials are used. <coughs> we create a sensorial experience, keeping the essence of coffee, aroma, texture, color schemes. Thanks to this, the total awareness of the recycling process is achieved by the consumers. They are involved and contribute. They feel the commitment of making the world a better place. As an industrial designer, I have always been especially concerned about the use of materials. This thought led me to fulfill my deepest dream of developing my unique material. To do so, I focused on reducing food waste, as it is a powerful resource that we have every day, that we interact with every day. The cafe has been awarded different prizes and recognitions. It has taken part in many worldwide exhibitions and uh, published in architectural and design books, magazines, and social media. 
thanks to this, two well-known brands have shown interest in our Decafe material for the interior projects. And currently, they keep on waiting for our industrialization for bigger, big, for bigger projects. The cafe lies cafes, restaurants, and hotels worldwide. And it is also present on the market with home accessories and jewelry. As a matter of fact, our product has been designed to, to get the user totally involved in a sensorial experience. Our main challenges have been finding the first client to, to trust it on the innovative the cafe products, selecting the proper distributors concerned about sustainability that are willing to, to promote the cafe making the consumers aware that behind our innovative uh, material, there is a deep concept of sustainability. These kind of solutions are not only eye-catching, but also totally necessary in a short period for preserving our planet. Now that you already know the cafe, what are you going to do with your, your capsules? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. Some real innovation, some creative thinking. Uh, and some beautiful uh, products as well. So there we are. Is that uh, a groundbreaking thought shaker that should be the one that wins on today's competition? Well, we have one more for you to uh, have a little think around. And I think we're going on to two wheels in order to do that uh, and linking up with Sweden. And uh, MEP Jakob uh, Delund is here to introduce the Swedish startup Velocipede. Many people have great ideas. Fewer people actually make them happen. Even fewer make them happen in a way that provides a better world for those who face poor living conditions. Jim Holm is one of those few. He has founded Velocity, a company that makes fantastic looking bikes in a sustainable way. But more importantly, for every bike they sell, they donate the bike to poor school girls in Ghana. And this is important because when girls have their own bikes, school <coughs> attendance goes up by 30% and their grades go up by 60%. So more bikes lead to a better world for all of us. And this is why you should vote for Jimmy and Velocity. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, it was really great. Uh, so let's begin with our name, Velocity. It stems from the French word vélo, that means bike, and philosophy, in the sense that we do more than just sell bikes. My name is, as you heard, Jimmy, and I'm the founder of Velocity. The one-for-one one bicycle brand, the only bike brand in the world donating bikes to young school girls in developing countries. One bike for everyone sold. Our mission is to support mobility, and we do that with four R's in mind. Reduce, reuse, recover, and recycle. Reduce, getting more people to choose biking before other means of transportation is a global good that will reduce the carbon footprint. Reuse, we offer sharing models, and our rent-out bikes gives a second life when we reuse them in migration programs where they have become cornerstones for integration. Recover, when buying donation bikes from manufacturers, bamboo manufacturers in Ghana, we actually support local labor and address youth unemployment at the same time. Recycle, we are one of the best in class when it comes to using recycled aluminum, yet we aim higher. All this is philosophy and what we are about empowering and mobilizing by unifying a great product with a social mission. And we have already seen results. So far we have provided school girls in Ghana with bikes to a value of 65,000 US dollars. Bikes that have increased attendance in school with 30% and the results is close to 60. And the bikes made of bamboo has contributed to new bamboo plantations that prevents land erosion and creates new jobs. And this is just the beginning. With a developing world in need of nearly 80 million bikes, I dare say we have some busy days ahead. <laughs> Thank you all for hosting me. So
So there we are, six extraordinary innovations, six extraordinary uh, innovators. Now we have a choice. We can either have a voting system based on the Eurovision Song Contest, which will take an hour and three quarters, or we can have one which takes three minutes. I go for the one that goes for three minutes. So, um, they're all winners, of course. They are amazing innovations. But we have an opportunity here of one that will get most of our votes, uh, who are just going to be particularly taken under the wing of Nespresso to offer some mentoring, some guidance from the circular economy and innovation people uh, within that company. So just to see whether we've got, of the six, one that just stands out as really sparking your attention. What I would like you to do is to do two things. Number one, you need the little sheet that has got the six uh, projects and the six colours. And in your other hand, so that means you have to put the agenda under your chin, you've got basically the six cards. I'd like you now, or over the next couple of minutes, gently to be thinking, which of the cards are you going to hold up? Because that will be your vote for one of those amazing six. What I'm going to do to give you a chance is I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to go around each of the innovators and ask them, uh, sitting down, just to put their colour card up, which means that all of them will get at least one vote, <laughs> which is theirs. If you do feel you want to vote for a different one, then just that's called disruption, which I like as well. So that's fine. So here we go. So our six projects, to jog your memory, don't put other cards up until the end, OK? So our first one was Paul Bristow, a pan gloss, the whole spirit of incubation. Circular economy is about new, disruptive systems, supporting each other, new ways of working, that incubation, local incubation. Is that a key to transformation? If it is, number one is your uh, innovation. Okay, number two, Brody Neal, the huge issue around plastic, marine pollution, plastic pollution in general, but specifically in the oceans, maybe raising awareness and creating beauty and new use out of those old plastics. If that is the one that you think, yeah, that's the message around circular eco economy change, then it's the white card that you'll put up in a moment. Keep it up in the air um, uh, so that uh, Samira, so we can see which one it is. Okay, number three, we head to Food Cloud uh, from uh, Ireland and the uh, pink on the pink. Uh, so you probably uh, uh, reuse shrimps and prawns as part of the waste. But uh, uh, connecting technology to connect um, food to local charities. There should be no food waste. This is one of the ways of bearing on it. Is that the project that actually says, yes, we want to encourage, support that sort of activity. Bear down on that and we find solutions. So that's the pink one. Number four. Um, my shoes are over there. They come out of uh, biomaterial from wine production uh, leftovers, creating fashion garments. So let's joy and celebrate whilst also being circular. Green is the colour. Uh, Veggie Company is the name. Is that the one uh, that should get today's uh, special award? Uh, if you can hold the green one up, one of you, so that, yes, if you can keep it held up, we, we have short attention spans um, uh, in this world. Okay, number five, the smell of coffee. So, uh, the cafe on Spain, uh, turning uh, uh, coffee grounds into pr premium interior design projects. Does that uh, lighten up a pathway forwards about the creative industrial symbiosis? Uh, symbiosis. One person's uh, byproduct is another person's feedstock. Does that give us an illustration of the way forward? That would be number five, the red one. And finally, goodness me, all things bicycles, not just in Sweden, in Africa, uh, thinking about uh, these uh, schemes in a creative way, getting everyone pedaling around the globe. Number six, that is philosophy. Does that point a whole new way around mobility resource efficient in itself, but also the resource efficient uh, recycling reuse of bicycles. 
and huge opportunities uh, supporting people in Africa as well. So there we are, six projects. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to come to, e um, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count down from five and then uh, when I get down to there, just stick your card up in the air and I have got CCTV, voting <laughs> tellers and everything to tell us who the winner will be. So here we are, this is the moment, they're all brilliant, but one of them, just yes, give them a Christmas boost as they innovate towards the future. Five, four, three, two, one. The innovator should be... I need some uh, Eurovision music now as this, uh, this happens, so I'm hoping the tellers are doing some tellers. Very interesting. So as we do the counting of this, our challenge as we come on to it is to say, OK, there is no shortage of innovations, but for every 1,000 innovations, maybe there's one that actually is a market disruptor, scales up and begins to take us really towards a new circular economy, both a local, regional, national, European and a global issue. Is there one around this table that actually maybe expresses what that is about? And then in the second part of our conversation, let's unpack a little bit more about that drive towards circular economy, but also what are those barriers, what are those challenges, who needs to be doing more, who isn't pulling their weight, weight? which partnerships do we need that we don't have, and more importantly, where are the big ideas that mean this isn't just something that happens at the margins of our economy, this is our new economy. So that's the challenge. So, here we are. I'm going to give a top three. So you can now take your cards down. Okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a top three. So, uh, joint uh, second and third. Ah, brilliantly. I, I'm going to increase tension because I'm trying to read what this says. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. Um, so, joint second and third. Uh, Velocity is in joint second and third, so congratulations to you for being, <laughs> being really very fabulously brilliant. And you sit comfortably uh, alongside... Is that right? Is these the numbers? <laughs> or have you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, did I? Whoa, just hold on a minute. Uh, a recount. You're absolutely right. So, I, I'm not going to tell you whether you have come anywhere near the top six at all. Well, you might be there. So, yes, here we go. Uh, green, which is uh, Vigia, uh, is a joint second. So, congratulations to our Italian star. So, your joint second. Pink, uh, Food Cloud, you are also joint second or nearly first, so congratulations <laughs> to you. And I gave you such an amazing build-up, and this may come as a source of some disappointment to you, or relation, because uh, just out with a small bicycle spoke ahead of everybody else, yes, it's blue, it's Velocity, who are... <laughs> Congratulations to you. Uh, what I would like to do uh, is invite Daniel Weston, uh, who's Global Head of Legal and Corporate Affairs at Nespresso, uh, just to uh, say a few words, and I think we have a small award to hand over. That is indeed correct. We have an exceptionally tiny award. <laughs> <laughs> Resource efficient. Exactly, which is going to fit in, uh, in, in um, carry-on luggage on the plane on the way home. So no problems with that. <laughs> Congratulations very much. I have to be honest, I, I could have voted for all six. So I, I think uh, it was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary af early afternoon. Um, just very quickly from Espresso's point of view, um, we're, we have a big company. Um, but 30 years ago, we were born with just 10 people. Uh, and 
You know, I, I think um, amazing things can be done, you know, with, with great ideas, with passion, with commitment, and lots of hard work. And I think what's very important to stress is that, you know, all of you have been born of innovation, and you have to continue innovating. You have to keep striving to, to beat down those barriers. One of the things we're hoping we can focus on in a debate coming up uh, this afternoon is how we work together in public-private partnership in order to deliver the circular economy. One of the things we're particularly focused on is uh, aluminium, and actually from that point of view, I'm also chairman of the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative, so I, it, I, you know, it makes my heart sing, actually, for somebody who makes aluminium bikes to win. But um, you know, we, we need to think about how do we get this extraordinarily valuable material back into the upstream supply chain uh, after use by consumers. Um, and you know, we've been working quite hard with municipal recycling facilities, offering incentives for them to adopt technology to increase the amount of aluminium that they store from packaging waste. Um, so one of the things that you know, I would love to, to stress to you is, is don't stop innovating, keep on trying to break down those doors and change everything. Um, and congratulations very much to you. Fantastic, Daniel. Thank you very much, and congratulations once again. And maybe it's appropriate that the winner is uh, is one of the projects that has uh, both a base within Europe, but a, uh, a a true global reach, thinking around some of the uh, great issues of social inequality that we are facing as a challenge. And is the circular economy part of giving an opportunity uh, for all, not just a few? That's one of the big challenges uh, in our. We've, we've got just under an hour for a little bit of conversation, some dialogue here. And before I say that, if I could very warmly thank our MEP um, uh, hosts and those who've been uh, uh, introducing the projects, and we salute you for the work that you are doing within these four, six, or 12 walls. It's a complicated place to be part of that journey towards rethinking, re-engineering, uh, our economy. Uh, we hope you'll be able to stay to be part of a conversation about very much looking about how do we turn these ideas, these, these thoughts into a tsunami of change. Europe is in fact right at the centre of that drive towards um, the journey towards a circular economy. Um, the circular economy uh, package recently came out and that's a whole raft of incentives uh, grants, regulations, other things that drive us in the right direction. So it's fitting we're having this conversation with a Europe focus and fitting that I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Kestutis Sadaskas, who's the um, Director of Circular Economy and Green Growth at DG uh, Environment, the European Commission, has been driving what is a very simple idea, but in fact, a hugely complex package. So, uh, uh, Kestutis, it's great to have you with us. You could give us a three-day lecture on the circular economy package. Uh, we'll give you three minutes in instead, just maybe to throw some particular thoughts to us that maybe resonate with our innovation theme. So, great to have you with us, and interested to hear a few thoughts from you. Good afternoon, and uh, well, I'm very happy to squeeze myself into three minutes. Indeed, I could do it for quite a long time, but if there is one uh, resource that we can't reuse and recycle, that's time. It never goes back into economy, so I'll be very uh, efficient uh, with that. Now, um, uh, one thought that just came uh, to my mind, and that was when um, uh, Madam um, uh, Rodriguez mentioned that she went to uh, to Costa Rica, to coffee plantation. I did that also a couple of years ago on holiday in beautiful Monteverde Mountains uh, cloud forest. Um, and uh, it's quite amazing to see a country which isn't that rich as most Europeans are, but really does amazing stuff for, uh, for sustainability and, and circular economy as a matter of fact. But what, um, what struck me in that coffee plantation was uh, when I was asking uh, the producers um, uh, is uh, which is the coffee bean that is best for Italian style espresso, I saw a frowning face looking at me from the producer and said, you know what, 
Italians are a disgrace in this world. I say, why? And I'm happy that um, uh, Giovanni Levi isn't here. He said, because they roast coffee to eight or nine degree, and they say it's a burnt product, and how about tasting it when it's burnt to, let's say, two or three or four degree? I've done that, and it does take you high, I can tell you. Yeah. And yet, uh, so, so I was starting to think, well, maybe after all, me, myself, being a big coffee lover, Maybe I shouldn't be uh, drinking the roasted coffee, but after having seen this, I think I'm going back to the <laughs> eight and nine level, because at least you can do something out of that, and, and the taste uh, still feels good. Uh, now, like uh, Mr. Weston, I would have uh, I've disenfranchised myself uh, from the voting, uh, because I simply couldn't make um, uh, a decision, and I could uh, easily have voted for, uh, for all six. Um, and I'll tell you that, um, you are an example of uh, how creative uh, Europeans really are. And that's, I think, a bit of, um, uh, let's say, an answer to, uh, uh, to an opening uh, by Davor Schlet, who said that we are, may not be good statistically at innovation, but I, I happen, I, I have, let's say, privilege, um, uh, deserved or undeserved privilege to participate in many of these meetings. And when we go to look for uh, where European investments uh, for, uh, for the research money, for the, the life environmental program, for structural funds, for just about any public investment goes into, usually uh, we encounter examples like yourselves. And these are amazing, amazing things. You know, basically, uh, what I can conclude is that you can produce everything from everything now. There hasn't been a thing that, uh, that, uh, that has not uh, crossed the mind. Of, of any innovator, and to me, putting a man on the moon uh, in 69 doesn't look that spectacular anymore from what I've seen, what can happen with the circular economy. Uh, at, and the, just as an example, we know now that we can get perfect plastics from the diapers, uh, or uh, that you can produce very good shoes, not only from, uh, from, from the raisin skins, but also from uh, uh, the fishnets that are caught from uh, from the sea. I'm, I'm still looking around for Adidas company to put that on the market because they announced it and I'll probably go and, and, and buy it whenever it's, it's out there. Or uh, I had also, let's say, Spaniard, a few, already a few years ago, who was coming to me and saying, well, listen, all your proposals about the fertilizer regulation, trying to recoup the phosphate uh, uh, from a bit more sustainable sources is really rubbish. And I said, why is it so? He said, because you can get it all from the toilet. He said, what I'm doing is, is I'm showing how I can get phosphorus for the fertilizers uh, from uh, public toilets and public events, like, uh, uh, like big rock festivals. And it's, th th these examples are really rife, really rife, and uh, the imagination is, is absolutely high. And I think it shows that Europeans are very creative, probably the most creative I've ever seen. And I'm very happy to, uh, to, to see that. The only uh, thing is that uh, where we have an issue is scaling up and putting the whole thing in the market. And as has been said already he here, the word uh, several times, that is disrupting the market, disrupting the incumbents, disrupting the ones that definitely would whine <laughs> and cry and complain about that disruption. But this is what we are really after. Now, circular economy, it is about uh, disruption. It is, it is a mega trend, it's a major trend. The only difference, or let's say a conspicuous difference to me, is that somehow that disruption seems to be a rather positive one. It creates good vibe. So far I've seen only societal consensus. Everybody's very positive about it. Probably because of the realization of the imperative, or the environmental and societal imperative that we need to, uh, we need to follow uh, with, this, um, with this project. But also because it opens up New minds opens up new ideas, and this is what we're trying to accompany and help and, and, and boost. We've, uh, we have put um, uh, a strategy for circular economy. I would say it's only the beginning. It's only, it's only the basis, only the fundamentals that are trying to build right now, but there is a, still a lot more to go. Uh, we're um, we fixing the issues of waste. We're fixing the issues of, of design, but I'll, I'll tell you that Still a lot to be done about uh, the, the products themselves, um, about recyclability, about the better design, about dismantlability. Uh, there is a lot more potential to be reaped from, um, from the interface with digital agenda. This is what we haven't done yet. And I think this is a major trend that's coming in. 
The next big thing I can tell you is chemicals. Now we know a lot more about chemicals than we knew before and, uh, and, and just wait uh, to see what, what will be happening in the, in, the first, uh, in the next few years. We'll soon be coming out with a strategy uh, for the plastics because it is a major issue. It's an issue, let's say it's, it's a material without which we, again, we can't put a man on the moon anymore. We can't live without, but which has spun out of control. And, uh, and it's created all kinds of uh, possible problems. And yet, it's a major opportunity because we have plastics all around us now. It's all in the anthroposphere. The only question is how to recover, how to recoup it and produce something, be it a table or shoe or toy or just about anything else. And we can produce anything else from the, from the wasted uh, plastic. So there is a lot that needs to be done. And it's really people like yourselves uh, that, that drive this trend. And we as humble um, public servants paid by taxpayers' money, we try to accompany and really help uh, this trend to happen. There are limits, there are limits to competence, there are limits even to intelligence sometimes, uh, because it's, it's, it's always the private business, it's always the private industry that takes it uh, a lot further than any public administration can do. I mean, we boast sometimes that, okay, internet, internet has been invented by public administration, GSM maybe has been also invented by that, but that's, about it. All of it really comes from private initiative and, and, and examples like yourself. So really uh, kudos for you. Um, it's an amazing example. It just testifies that we are innovative. We can show the way to the world. We can probably be a lot more naughty and probably even dictate the standards to the world, but standards, dictating standards in a good way, in a sustainable way. And uh, that if there is a future for one uh, paradigm and one strategy that's certainly a circle of harmony. So thank you very much for, for this. Yet another good inspiration that we are on the right track here. <coughs> thank you very much indeed. And having been uh, in, involved uh, moderating the, the launch of the circular economy package and also the stakeholder platform, uh, which is really trying to provide that space within which different sectors together can gather together, uh, together. We're seeing some really drive to create that framework uh, within which uh, innovation and uh, change, uh, both in terms of technology and process, can take place. What I'd like to do uh, now is open up our conversation. Uh, I suppose it's really in, in three parts, but, but maybe two and a half parts, we'll see. First of all, uh, it would be great maybe for us to share and celebrate uh, some of the other innovation successes we're seeing around Europe as significant systemic change takes place uh, either within an organization or within a city or whatever else. But also from that is thrown up issues, barriers, challenges. I want to innovate, <coughs> but... And if we see some of the buts, some of the barriers, maybe those are areas for us to work on. So I'd like to have some conversation just bringing into the room uh, some examples of great innovation, uh, but also maybe some messages it's having about the challenges and barriers of innovation. And then maybe look a little bit around uh, how we ensure some of that infrastructure uh, is in place, that if we're willing to be a more circular economy, how do we make sure that the means to achieve that are there? But then, very particularly, also looking at the consumer as part of this. We are producing goods, services, stuff, satisfying people's needs. How do we engage better with the consumer? Is the consumer really driving this change? Or do we need to be part of the informing, enabling, awareness raising, make it easy for consumers to be part of the right <coughs> journey forward? And how do we do that? Interested in exa examples both from the public realm, the private realm, as it is from large corporations like Nestle and Nespresso, or small startups. You're all invited to be part of the conversation. Particularly interested to hear voices. Uh, from uh, MEPs who are uh, still with us in the room. If I could just offer one little guidance, I think uh, basically if someone puts a hand up, we will, I will choose to come to them. Ron ending up with a stockpile of 30 people. The great thing is if we can have a listening conversation, so I'd quite like someone to start something off 
and then someone to actually build or add something to it rather than us just having a series of disjointed innovate, uh, interventions. So if we can see this as a developing conversation, maybe that will be more powerful. So uh, hold your powder dry till after the first intervention and if you think you can build or, or work with something you've heard from someone, that should make for a richer uh, conversation. Uh, also, uh, I'm a bad role model, but I wanted to say that if we can keep interventions short from here on in, it'll mean that we can get the maximum number of people offering a thought or an idea. So I'm going to go to the first part, which is really maybe around this table. Is there anyone who just kind of really wants to uh, celebrate some of the amazing innovations are happening and maybe throw up a couple of thoughts around uh, some of the challenges and barriers uh, we face? Um, Actually, as I look, I look around, I see that we've got um, Ljubljana represented. Is that correct? Greenest city in the EU, probably according to Ljubljana. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 Frank uh, uh, Bogovic, MEP, a couple of thoughts from you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations for all uh, startups. I changed my mind. I will not speak about uh, green capital because it was too much thought about this. I will speak about one case in which I was involved. Mm -hmm. uh, as a young guy, I started to be a leader of a small community, 800 people. Later I was mayor and now also minister, and now I'm here in the European Parliament. Story started about uh, waste, uh, communal waste management. And in late 80s, when I started to be a local politician, we made that we collect uh, this communal waste from forests together with hunters, together with young people, the sport clubs, and we started to think about thinking about the environment. Later, when I was mayor, we made uh, uh, in uh, primary schools be, uh, between pupils, uh, such a clubs of uh, young people who are involved in ecological uh, things, and we organized the uh, ecologic market. And the young pupils, they sell jam, they sell uh, juice and other things. And we, try, we also go around uh, Slovenia and also in other countries to show good cases of way, uh, communal waste management. Later, when I was mayor, we decided to work hardly on these communal wastes. First, we built uh, around 200 uh, ecological islands in the municipality, starting with uh, sorting communal wastes. During that time, uh, one company from Germany, Willy Stadler, World Prayer, in, uh, in uh, building uh, this communal resorting machine, uh, was, uh, I, uh, as mayor, I invited them and they arrived to us as uh, Greenfield Investments. Now they have a company with 150 jobs. Uh, they all of our model work uh, company. And with them, later we built a communal waste center in my municipality. It's 25,000 people and it's for around 100 people all around. Right. And the results after this are this, that uh, uh, we uh, let field only less than 4% of communal wastes. Paper is selected and it is also in connection with uh, paper company in, in our municipality. Uh, all plastics, all metal materials, compost are selected. And now it's time that we continue our work uh, with such a startup that uh, we do with more with uh, with uh, this uh, uh, recycling and uh, till today we have uh, another uh, new 50 jobs in this uh, communal company and uh, the costs for people are lower because uh, we manage this uh, communal waste so well that we can also uh, get some income through selling these recycling uh, components and less than 4% we are uh, in front of the targets of uh, Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and clearly the enabler of that is an, uh, an uh, leadership for an inspiring mayor. If you were to just identify very quickly one of the barriers you see, biggest barriers around innovation, is there something that you come up with that it always seems to be a barrier? Yes, it's always <coughs> the barriers are these that we must find such a niche product that we can reach high price. Otherwise, in the beginning, it's not so easy to make right. plastic uh, uh, or bar-based plastic instead right. of fossil based. So I think that it's necessary to to help to push that uh, these uh, people who have this innovation yeah. can survive and that it will be later on big scale. The market is a brutal testing ground, yes. Thank you very much indeed. I just wonder, um, uh, Gesine Meissner, 
uh, also uh, with us, uh, MEP. Uh, and I think you've been doing things involved in the in the mar uh, maritime world. Is that is that right? Yes, a little bird right. <laughs> told me. Like other footballers. That's why. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I'm uh, no. First of all, I thank you to be here because it's a very creative and thrilling atmosphere in the room. Really, when you come in here, you can feel that that it's in innovative and everything and great and. That's why I really like to be here. I regret that I couldn't hear all the projects. Well, I voted for one. I voted for one for Marie Litter because that's something I am very much taking care of. But I'm here working in different committees, and so uh, circular economy is something really that just drives me forward. And coming from North Germany, I'm as well interested in in um, products, for example, uh, with wood base, with wood uh, wood uh, waste base, so to say. And I try to see wherever I can if there anything around. But you ask me, that's right. I'm the president of a certain intergroup, <coughs> Seas Rivers Island and Coastal Areas, and I try to, to, to concentrate very much on, on marine litter and everything that's sea-based in general. So we don't have that many, that many possibilities yet to recycle something co coming from the ocean, although we have had one product just here in the room with the products made out of, of, of um, marine or ocean plastics. But there are some other uh, things, for example, like bio waste based aquaculture products um, producing seaweeds or even recycling shells. That's a possibility that's already in place. And uh, we can, for example, reuse the hard parts of lobsters and so on. But there we have to be careful because by using it, we have to crack it and then the CO2 will be in the air because it, they bind CO2. So we always have to look at the whole matter, what we can really do. You see already, I don't look at only one possibility coming out from the ocean, but at everything that's possible. Fertilizers, for example, can, uh, can be out of recycling shells, and we can use uh, products out of the sea recycled ones for restore reefs. So several things are already in place. Many others can, can be thought of. And I think it's so important to look at what possibilities do we have to, to reuse things out of the sea. Of course, at first, get rid of the marine litter and plastic and reuse it in other, in other solutions, but as well to see what offers the sea as a, as a whole. And for example, algae, it's not really circular economy, but algae is right now uh, in discussion to be nutrition as well as energy maybe, or, uh, or a medicine or so. So we really should see what is aware, what is available, and what can we go for. Other things, for example, is uh, that recycling of fishing gear is possible. Not everything can be uh, recycled that's in the sea once, as litter or so, because sometimes it's poor quality, sometimes the salt erosion did damage the material too much, but there are still several things we can do. And we already have in place clothes of marine litter. That's something I really think is fantastic. So we should try to focus what is already in place, what can we do more in order to achieve still more. And while well, ship recycling is something we, we cannot have anything out of yet, but maybe it will <coughs> something be in place in future. And I think it's very much to go for that. And since you're going to ask me probably what are the barriers, <laughs> Did you want to? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the barriers are, well, of course, uh, first, we need more research. We have to really finance research in all this sector in order to come forward with more ideas. And then, of course, we have to support startups by finances. That could be a barrier not to have enough finances or not to have enough, uh, yeah, enough income in view at the end of the chain, so to say. And besides, I think. Europe is very bureaucratic, yet it's too bureaucratic for startups, and that really can hinder something as well to be innovative. What we saw it right here, we have very good examples for innovative products in the circular economy, but it can be eased uh, still further, and that's what we have to look for. Fascinating, thank you. And it's, it just shows the more you think about the possibilities, the more they open up. Yeah. I, I was in uh, Denmark last week running a, a big thing around innovation for circular economy and uh, someone was using algae as a, a substitute for, for print ink. There we are, there's a thought for Nespresso. You no longer have to think about chemicals in your printing. Well, hey, suddenly it's these funny little green things that I do not understand. So the, the, the possibilities are limitless. It's the practical getting that to the market. Time will never be our friend in this conversation. I do just wonder, I'd like to hear from any of our innovators, 
not any more about how amazing their wonderful innovations are, but if you've been, if you see clear barriers that seem to be in place that somehow we ought to be able to sweep aside to get that extraordinary rush of energy turning into scalable action. Would be interested in any thoughts. Paul. I'll give you a couple straight away. The first one is that um, environmental costs are internalized for us and they're externalized for all the companies that aren't in the, in the, uh, in the circular economy. So you, know, you ask why do, uh, these why do these products have to be niche? They have to be niche because they are more expensive because all the other companies that aren't doing this have a cost advantage. Um, and the, the, the second one, and, the, and this one I'm still struggling with, and I'm not even sure how you guys will, would solve this one, but there's a difference between recycling, which is mostly downcycling, you can recycle products a couple of times and then that's it, landfill or in incineration. And the circular economy, which is basically keeps going forever. So what would be really good is if we can come up with you know, the, the A to G scale, but for circular products. So we have ones that are coming from sustainable sources, but also ones that can, after their useful lifetime, be reused themselves. Because we're, we're heavily involved in the 3D printing world and we see issues with composite materials that you can make composite materials very easily, but what happens with them afterwards becomes a nightmare as it goes into material flow. So if we can, I don't know how you're gonna make that simple and understandable, neither for the companies nor for the consumers, but this is something that we have to deal with. Because the end result yep. for a circular economy is no bin. It's as simple as that. Yeah, no, that's a couple of very, uh, very significant things. A interesting, sometimes aluminium is the noble exception. That seems to be endlessly... Yeah, um, but it's easy. That's right, that's right, yes. Or copper, yeah. for example, copper is one. Absolutely, and maybe we have to start with the easy ones, you know, that, but that's they can show a illumination, illumination of possibilities. <laughs> that's my last bad joke of the afternoon. Anything else just from our entrepreneurs in terms of, and our innovators around just thoughts of, ah, that's the that's what's holding this whole thing back. Anyone uh, of our innovators want it? Yeah, Emma. Um, so we do a lot of work, I suppose, as I said earlier, working with businesses to understand where their waste comes from. And we see some businesses that have really embraced, I suppose, this whole concept of valorization and the bioeconomy. Um, but the, what, what we've also seen is that because we have access to, I suppose, hundreds of food businesses and we're talking to them about waste, We've seen that some are doing really innovative things in kind of a niche area. Maybe they have lots of beetroot, uh, mulch as a byproduct, and they've done great things with it, or avocado stones. We all love smashed avocados at the moment, so what do we do with all the stones? But actually, the sharing of all of those ideas and all of that innovation, if it's just being done, I suppose, in one business, and it's not, um, and those ideas aren't visible, I suppose, to businesses that don't maybe have the capital to invest in these ideas or the research budgets, then I, I guess that, that's a challenge for us moving forward as well. So I think from Food Cloud, what we'd love to see is that people, you know, there's more things where people are coming together to actually share this innovation and share this research. And that, um, I suppose, innovation that's been developed in large companies is becoming available to those in small companies as well. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Just take on this idea of uh, any particular inhibitors, barriers that we ought to be bearing down on um, which are just stopping that uh, that transformation taking place. Yeah, uh, first on there and then to the next one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you'd like to say uh, who you are and where you're from, that's very helpful. Thank you. My name is Philippe Michonaudet. I work at ACR Plus, Association of Cities and Regions for Sustainable Resource Management. And um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say congrats to all the, uh, the, the, the cases that were presented, uh, the six uh, uh, innovations uh, were worthwhile willing as indeed. And uh, we will not have enough brain to remember all the cases, so I strongly encourage you to share the knowledge indeed. And Mr. Sadowskas uh, did not have the time to uh, uh, spoke too much about it, but uh, the European Commission, uh, together with the European Social and, uh, Economic Committee, launched recently a platform uh, where stakeholders and innovators can uh, promote and share their knowledge and innovations. So I strongly encourage you six to, and all the innovators to publish those cases on this platform to increase uh, the, uh, the, uh, the capacities of other 
uh, uh, potential innovators. Um, two key uh, barriers, in, in my opinion, in addition to, to the ones that were already mentioned. Uh, the first one is the fact that in most uh, supporting uh, financial schemes, there is not enough place for the risk to fail. Mm. And this is something that has to be taken into account from the financial uh, body's perspective uh, and to allow uh, innovators to fail as well and to try and not be uh, in the fear of failing. The second fact, uh, the second barrier in my opinion is that um, despite all of this knowledge, this is mostly, uh, st it sticks still in the bubble and uh, there is not enough um, uh, focus put on education. We have uh, heard a little bit uh, about uh, from Mr. Bogovic uh, the, the case of uh, having some talks in schools and, and groups of environmental uh, aware people, uh, um, children, but there is a need of more focus on education and I think about uh, funding programs like Erasmus Plus uh, where there is clearly a lack of focus uh, on circular economy and because this is clearly not a, a priority enough. So my call would be for the MEPs and EU institutions in general to uh, really mainstream and put their efforts to mainstream circular economy as a priority in all funding programs, especially the ones on education. Right, okay, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Joachim Foden from the Extended Producer Responsibility Alliance. We are comprising 26 uh, packaging recovery organizations, all non-for-profit, all owned by industry. Uh, for us, we see this immense potential if the circular economy package from the European Commission, especially in the way how the Parliament amended it as well, if this is finally uh, approved, we see there a really great potential uh, to, to go the next steps with the higher targets, with the lower targets for landfill, with the uh, very good general minimum, what is the current word, minimum criteria for extended producer re responsibility. So we are calling for the two institutions to stay brave and hold the flag up because we are hearing a lot of uh, member states. Of course, everybody is supporting the circular economy, but uh, we are not so sure whether they are really so ambitious as the Commission and as the par par Parliament are. And as industry are, because as far as I understand, also the members of Eu European are fully supporting the circular economy package. So it seems that everybody is supporting the circular economy pa package, but we hear that there's a lot of demands to lower the targets, to give more deadlines, to be not so strict on e EPR minimum re requirements. Why transparency? Why this? Why this? So we are really calling for the Commission and to the European Parliament to stand brave and not to to bargain too much on the Turkish bazaar, which is currently taking place in the tri trialogue. Thank you. Thank you for that. I just wonder whether anyone wanted to uh, respond to that uh, uh, very important. Um, uh, well, it's already the direct response is oh. for another addition. Okay, if I can hold that for a second, uh, uh, particularly thinking around uh, extended uh, producer responsibility, because that could be a, a key driver around resource efficiency. You know. Yeah, okay. yeah, Daniel. Well, this is perhaps just just an observation, but it, it is interesting with with some um, we call them MERFs, municipal urban recycling facilities. How w once they reach the targets that have already been set in legislation for recycling certain materials, for example, uh, light metal, uh, aluminium, um, which is at sixty percent, they they're quite happy to stop there. <laughs> so I, I think there is a critical role to be played by. You know the public sector by 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 governments in being brave and stretching those targets and and, and driving change. Um, you know we we're, we're there. We're prepared to help pay for change in facilities so that they can recover yeah. more. But they're fine because they're meeting their current targets. So I I, I completely support what you're often saying. I think it's extremely important. Right. And I think you know the European institutions play a key role. Here. Okay, just keep on this theme for a moment. Yeah. So this is Jean-Marc Simon from Zero Waste Europe. Uh, following on the issue of producer responsibility, I think it is very important to start also planning the future. I think producer responsibility has played a very good role in covering the costs of collection and treatment of, uh, of materials and, and waste. I think for the future and for the circular economy, producer responsibility should play a role 
to give incentives for sustainable products to go into the market. It's not only a cost coverage approach, it's, all, it's an incentive for good design, it, which was the principle of producer responsibility when it was created. And I think that when we talk about the future, it's very important to factor in that. And second thing, the scope. I mean, so far, producer responsibility is being used for some products out there, but the majority of products in the market don't have producer responsibility. I think we should expand to include them though, there because as we have seen with the examples here today, the issue is that we have uh, lots of demand for products, for ways to be turned into products, but it's very difficult to access this. So we need to create these channels that connect what is waste today with the products in the future and expanding producer responsibility scope could be a way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone, any of our MEPs just want to offer a resp yeah, response? Uh, but before you produce your response, mm. but since you just said that EP is so, so, so good, well, and, and several things, of course, we are very supportive of the circular economy, but we always have to, to look as, as consumers as well in our surrounding whether anything can be improved. For example, right here, we still use plastic bottles everywhere instead of having uh, just sources for water, for example. Or another thing, if I want to, to eat a sandwich, uh, I always go to the sandwich, sandwich bar because then I thought it wouldn't be wrapped into plastic, but if you order a sandwich, before it, it's put in the, in the paper bag, it's, it's, it's wrapped in, in plastic. And that's really, uh, and, and I tried to already to, to uh, pay attention to that and, and to change it, but yet it was not possible because it's just a tradition of this sandwich, uh, sandwich area, you know? And so we always have to think, all of us, I think, be it as MEP or to producer or only consumer, to, to look around and to try to influence other people, hey, that's something where you can avoid waste, for example, and okay. besides uh, using circular economy products. No, thank you for that. And we'll be coming on talking a little bit about consumer uh, awareness and behaviour in a moment. Just a couple of other quick thoughts, and then I'm going to move on to that. Yeah, did, did, sorry, it's you first, yes. So I'm um, Gwendolyn Ryu from uh, European. We represent the, the packaging supply chain uh, in, in Europe. And, uh, and m most of our members uh, or multinational companies, just like Nestle, and, and have factories in different member states in Europe. And one key point, which we see also as a potential threat, is a fragmentation of the internal market because companies need uh, the scale to innovate and hence need the, the, the internal market to also innovations in terms of environmental improvements, uh, uh, eco-design, uh, everything needs the, that's why we need this internal market. And, and that's the reason why European, along with 127, uh, 128 other organizations um, is concerned about a potential change of the legal base of the packaging and packaging waste directive, which is currently being discussed in, in the trailer. Uh, so in the internal market is something very important for innovation, as this is the topic which is of uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll take that message back to the UK as well. Uh, Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> from Food Drink Europe. We represent the food and drink uh, industry. Um, and uh, one of the barriers as well linked uh, um, somehow to what um, Wendelin stated about the internal market is about the diff different uh, perceptions and um, regulations within member states to define byproducts, especially within the food industry. Uh, our producers have uh, outlets uh, that are not mm, uh, uh, especially the main product they produce, but they have outlets that uh, they can serve as a raw material for other industries in the uh, either the food chain or other uh, other sectors. Um, it is difficult. Uh, uh, this sorry, it, these materials are initially classified as waste, and they have to prove a set of criteria that they meet a set of criteria to be able to be classified as byproducts and therefore be able to be used in other uh, sectors uh, and therefore and this interpretation is as well different within different member states and within the new legislative review of the waste framework directive this is going to still be kept as um, to be uh, identified and assessed by national author uh, authorities this is it is relevant for us that there's a harmonization in what is considered a byproduct and that so that m as many um, outlets from our 
uh, from the food and drink industry can go into other lines and contribute to industrial symbiosis. Thank you very much uh, indeed. I, I, I want to move our, um, partly driven by uh, the clock over there, I want to open up our conversation really about this issue of engaging with, uh, with the consumer being part of that journey. Just before I do, I, I just wonder, uh, we've put together quite an impressive lift, list, uh, Kastutis, um, of some of the challenges and barriers. I suspect most, if not all of them, will be familiar to you. I just wondered whether there was anything you wanted to pull out as either particular uh, initiatives or drives or, or challenges that you're having in the European Commission that, that you'd love more support to try and uh, find solutions. Is there anything you'd particularly uh, want to draw out? I also just ask a comment on this uh, vexed issue around extended producer responsibility because that, uh, for, for, the, for the naive among us, that seems to be an extraordinarily uh, powerful way of driving uh, resource efficiency and change. Yes, well, very briefly, um, my duty in my vocation would be to help folks like that. Uh, it's these people that uh, I'm really trying to work for. And uh, when you said that um, the internalizing cost uh, is key in order to put a level playing field into into um, into the competition here and to open up the way for the new product, that's uh, I fully agree with you. There are different ways how to do it. Market-based instruments are usually the best ones. There are quite a few of them. But the, ones, uh, the one that is most successful in the circular economy in the waste management and the waste prevention, it is the extended producer responsibility. Uh, so that's what we're trying to, uh, to fix in the current legislation. It's not going to be a, let's say, a, a foolproof solution uh, for the future, uh, precisely because I see that there, are, uh, there is some foot dragging but there is also some rationale behind it because I mean, we have on the market, I don't know how many millions of types of the products. Now, can you imagine any PR of you know, millions of schemes of EPR? It is impossible. It's simply mind boggling. So we need to choose the right ones. Uh, those where the volumes are the highest or where the potential is the highest and to, uh, to, to design schemes for, for those, even the most, um, um, progressive country in this way, I would say France, for instance, by the way, which is then castigated by quite a few others like packaging for going a bit further than the internal market, has introduced, I think, 20 plus um, uh, different uh, extended producer responsibility scheme, but it's 20 plus out of millions of products, millions of products. So we need to keep that perspective in mind. Nevertheless, yes, it's a, it's a promising avenue and uh, Whatever will come out of the legislation will be better than, certainly better than that it is right now. That is at least to make it transparent, at least to make it logical, accountable, so that businesses who will be either forced or incentivized to participate in the scheme, they will have an incentive. They will, uh, they will have all the transparency and accountability rules, uh, rules in place. So that's what we're trying to, to do. Same thing for, for instance, for byproducts or in the waste or, or others. Yes, it's not going to solve the uh, ideally the way uh, you want it because again um, to uh, design rules for everything everything that can be by product and anything any of the things that we throw away is waste or can be by product uh, it's just impossible it's just impossible so what we're trying to do is fix some ground rules so that uh, what is not waste shouldn't be waste at right. least uh, so that it is not treated as a waste but rather as an input, or, the, uh, or let's say, as still a product which can freely travel across the borders in the internal market. So internal market for us is absolutely, yeah, that's the one that we'll try to preserve at whatever it takes. Okay, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and I had uh, recently um, uh, um, Paul Eakins, uh, who came up with Factor 4, this idea of resource efficiency, new idea coming on that is, is extended producer responsibility to Factor 4, which is basically saying if we are going to deal with the global challenge we face, an increasing population, more people wanting stuff, we have got to do radical things. And he was suggesting that what we actually do is we make the producer um, actually... Uh, have ownership and responsibility for all the materials. We as consumers merely purchase the service 
and the producers really got to make a brilliant business model that means that they take all the stuff back. I'm not a recycler. I'm a, I'm a, I live in a house. I'm trying to live a life. You're amazing producers. So uh, interesting, radical, saying that we may be talking a little bit about extended responsibility, producer responsibility now, but in five years down the line, if we're not really getting a dramatically changed trajectory, we're going to be that much closer to some of the great global challenges that many of our scientists are fearing. So interesting, are we being ambitious enough? Maybe this takes us on to the next conversation, which is, okay, there are, I don't know how many million people in Europe, how many billion there are going to be, seven to nine billion people around the, uh, around, uh, the planet. How are they, the consumers of these goods and services that we wonderfully offer, how are they part of a marching army of change, actually being a contributor and part of the circular economy, rather than just being, being the wise monkey, deaf, dumb, blind, saying, well, I just purchased this stuff, it's not my problem. So it'd be interesting just to draw out, we sometimes leave the consumer out of the conversations. Are there any thoughts, uh, insights around engagement with the consumers so that they are a partner, driver, whatever it is of choices around products and services that take us towards circular economy? Um, or is that just too complicated an issue? Who would like to throw a thought into the pot around that engagement side of things? Yeah, and just remind us again who you are, where you're from. Yeah, Philippe Michonaudet, ACR Plus. So, uh, Pangloss Labs gives us a very good example of that the fact that citizens are more and more involved uh, and in the collaborative economy and, and sharing knowledge and so on. Wikipedia was uh, just a, a big example, but now you are more and more with Airbnb and, and, and others. With business models that are also progressively tested and implemented uh, with some corrections that will have to happen on the way. But there is hope uh, uh, on, on that side regarding the involvement of uh, and the ownership that is taken by citizens. Uh, for the vast majority, though, uh, of consumers and citizens, there is a, a, a big need of, of uh, raising their awareness through different activities, education that has been mentioned, but also some awareness raising campaigns. Uh, I take the example of the European Week for Waste Reduction that uh, took place at the end of uh, the month of November every year uh, since 2009. This year, more than 13,000 actions related to waste prevention, uh, improving uh, selective collection schemes and so on have been implemented uh, uh, all over Europe in, th in 30 countries. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an example of, of long-lasting initiative that has been launched by the European Commission uh, with the support of the European Commission at the beginning and that is now continuing uh, without uh, EU funding. So these kind of initiatives have to uh, take more space. We see more and more campaigns on marine litter. Uh, this is something that is needed as well. Uh, and, and this can be need funding, obviously. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, yes. Um, I just want to pick up that point about um, particularly linking back to marine litter. For example, when we're working on the projects um, with Ocean Karakto and creating the material, the majority of the ocean plastic is collected by what we would call Joe Public. So it's, you know, beach combers, um, coastline groups, activists, environmentalists, they are the charities um, that are involved as well, and they're the ones who are on the beaches and the coastlines collecting plastic, um, packaging them up, sending them to our studio. Um, you know, we would make a donation in return for the work that they do to continue that work going. But I think the really the opportunity is to bring all the elements together. It's, I think it's a multifaceted problem and it needs to be tackled in that way. So it's, it's the role, it's the government, it's big business, and it's general citizens. Well, I think it's. I don't think it would help the situation right. in any way if we leave them out of the out of the problem. Okay, I, I just wanted, uh, Daniel. I think you did some recent. I mean, you have a, a close relationship with many consumers who are generally very happy. Uh, I think you did some research recently. Was that right? Which gives you maybe some clues as to whether they're remotely bothered about uh, the world of circular economy as part of their purchasing habits. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Actually, but maybe just before to addressing that, just to say your idea of, you know, instead of selling stuff, selling, you know, the use of stuff, um, turn, turning things into service, I think is, is, a, is a really powerful one, one we should explore more. Um, just coming to, to the, the research, yes, we did, we did some research. I, probably it won't shock anybody in the room 
to find out the results, but most people claim to recycle it. Somewhere around 95% of people, if you ask them, they claim to recycle. But then you go and actually see what they do, and it's a totally different story. It's, uh, uh, everybody, and, and so what we try to do is get behind it and say, well, what is holding you back from recycling it? So, so asking it in a different way. Um, and I think that two key things came out. W one is um, consumers didn't understand that certain products were recyclable at all. So right. they, they, there was no communication around you know, the, 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 the product that it was recyclable. And the second thing was, if they did get the concept that it was recyclable, they absolutely had no idea how to then recycle that particular product. I think going to your point about, you know, there are millions of different kinds of, 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 of streams of, of waste that needs to be, to be recycled. So I think what, what we need to do is uh, work really hard on communication about recyclability and then work really hard on very simple solutions. So don't get the consumer to, uh, I'm thinking French here, but trier, what's the word in English? Sort, exactly, in, in, their, own, in their own house. Take, take that problem away from them. Um, and, and then do it somewhere else. And I think this is where you know, we've got some fantastic technologies of, uh, evolving to be able to sort things uh, that come in a mixed uh, waste stream. So those, those were the sort of two, two key insights, but I think probably right. not mind-blowing. Okay, okay. Wanted to take one or two other brief comments on this one. Yes, Cassina. Okay, yes. I think the consumer re responsibility regarding circular economy is twofold. One is, of course, uh, trying to, to make them avoid waste in general. So again, an example of us as, as parliamentarians, whenever we are invited to a certain working dinner or so, I always try to figure out how, hung how hungry are, uh, am I and do I really need the dessert or would I only eat uh, one spoonful, then I just don't, don't take it. So that is one thing and of course besides it must be that people know about uh, nutrition in general, that it's uh, really how, how, many, how much they should uh, buy in order to, to be able to eat it all and so on. This is one thing. And of course, uh, and microbeads and, and another ocean thing, microbeads are in clothing and microbeads are in cosmetics and we can buy different ones so we would avoid. And the other thing is of course, use recycled products. And that's why, first of all, many com uh, consumers don't know what is really recycled, what they can buy. And toilet paper, everybody knows, for example, and, and papers to write on as well. But several other things are not known at all. So we need to, wear, um, to, to raise awareness and to make campaigns for that. And, and last but not least, something that really um, yeah, keeps me busy, for example, recycling plastic seems to be a different technology in Germany than in Belgium. For example, in Belgium, you can only recycle plastic bottles in, in, in a certain bag, right. where, what is collected in my apartment, for example. In Germany, we can recycle more different kinds of types of plastic. I don't know why it's so different. So I think if it's possible in one country, it should be possible in the other country as well to recycle more plastic, for example, or other um, other products or so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll take one or two other uh, thoughts there and there. Yeah. Yeah, Jomar from Zero Waste Europe. I think that awareness raising is key, but it's it's clearly not enough. In Zero Waste Europe, we work with around 400 municipalities, and if something we can say is that citizens are not walking NGOs. Citizens, like companies, have economic interests, and if something is easier and cheaper, they will do it. Even without awareness raising, we do uh, communication. But the problem we have today is that wasting is cheaper and is easier than preserving, recycling, etc. Companies would go broke if they would be citizens today because the incentives are not there to do the right job. So don't expect citizens to go, but there's some motivated people, and we work with motivated people. But at municipality level, you give them a good system, the right incentives, and it's easier to do the right thing, and the citizens will follow. But communication is not enough. Okay, thank you very much. There's another here. Um, just a comment to the international di dimension, especially for, for marine litter. As far as I understand, 80, 90% of the new input is ca coming from countries outside Europe. So I think there is a big potential for us and uh, the European Commission is doing their circular economy mission, but this has to be, I don't know, a constant process of the European Commission, but also of industry as well, to share our no knowledge how to solve the problem. And if you see all the dump sites, uh, dump sites built directly at the sea in uh, Beirut, I think, there's one of the biggest dump sites uh, in, in the world. And with every wave, they take waste into the Mediterranean Sea. So even if we do not uh, litter one single item in Europe, there will be still a lot of 
mass ca coming from other countries. So we really perhaps have to use the financial aids that we gave to push them, ask them a little bit okay. more to invest it in the right way. And Belgium is extending the collection of the plastic. <laughs> like so so <laughs> don't Good worry, we are working on this. <laughs> okay. Paul, did you want to just uh, offer a thought? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've been looking at the, uh, the modular design and things, and, but one of the things that comes in on this, on this whole extended producer responsibility and how it fits in with consumers, is most of the problem we have when we're trying to recycle stuff or trying to reuse a waste flow is what the heck is it? <laughs> so you know, for me, if we had a QR code or something on the bottom of the product that we could flash and it would say, this is this material, it's made by this manufacturer, this is how you, I can either recycle it, or this is how you take it, you send it straight to the waste incinerator. It wouldn't take rock, a rocket scientist to take that and say, have a consumer friendly front end that said, this is where you need to take this in France, in Germany, etc. Yeah. <coughs> and that would be really handy. Maybe if you did, maybe if you got somebody, you incentivize people to do that, to tell people how they could dismantle and reuse this product or work with the waste material, then you wouldn't even need extended producer responsibility. You could get rid of it completely because this would then become a useful input stream into the circular economy. Right. There's an opportunity for an innovator. Actually, I was uh, with an innovator last week who had produced a thread, a piece of thread could go in every cloth, um, item of clothes that actually had basically the tag of what it was, what it was made out of, all the rest of it. So when it was used, recycled, all the rest of it, you, you just did, you know, use the technology. It's easy to do in expensive things, less easy to do in the plastic wrapped around the sandwich. In a coffee cup, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get there uh, somehow. Okay. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, we originally were going to be thrown out at 14.30, such is the resource efficiency of this uh, building that they had another meeting. But they've given us a little bit of wiggle room, uh, but I don't think we should wiggle too far because we've had a, a rich discussion. But I just wondered, uh, just a, a very quick round, just in the last couple of moments, I'm going to invite just one or two comments on what's come out. But just around your table, our challenge, uh, our challenge today has been, uh, clearly, we see no shortage of innovation potential. We've seen it manifest uh, among six of our innovators. We could have had so many more. We've heard about some of the barriers, some of the challenges, whether it's about supporting startups, whether it's reducing buro bureaucracy, creating new level playing fields. It's how do we internalise the full costs rather than just... Uh, that for, for uh, those sustainable products, um, issues around extended re responsibility. And you'll see what the European Commission is doing through the circular economy package. I just wondered, I don't require something for everyone, but if you had a one-liner, a big idea, something you've been carrying, which is a breakthrough thought, we've got ears from major consumer-facing corporations here, we've got ears of innovators, we've got ears of MEP, we've got ears of facilitators, we've got ears of the world out there through the webcast. If there were a message, a thought, a big idea, that in 20 years' time they could trace back to that conversation on this date in the European Parliament as a breakthrough moment of inspirational thought, what would that be? No challenge. So I've thrown mine into the pot, which is I will never before again have a, have a, a pay for a product. I will entirely pay for a service and the producer will have an elegant system that means that they take responsibility for taking back and it works as a business model. So there we are, that's a biggie. Who else has got something? Throw in the pot, excite me, yes. Reduce VAT on secular products and, and VAT on, on, on taxes on uh, human labor Reduce. for secular economic products. Brilliant, let's use the tax system to incentivize good stuff and penalize bad stuff. There we are. E that's an easy win for our MEPs. <laughs> There's a moment v VAT is mentioned, I, I feel shivers. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you comment before you declare that's going to be your mission for the next five years. Okay, any other? Just, just cracking breakthrough thought ideas. System change, what? Sure, let's create an open source database of exactly how people should design circular products and make it so that all of the startups across Europe can just 
tap into that and build on the, the knowledge, the shared knowledge that's been done. Do it at a collaborative level and then what she's done and what I've done and what you've done can build up to something. And that's in the spirit of moving from a world that's competitive and holding its own little thing to saying there's so much innovation to go around. Let's spread the joy and we'll all make money and save the planet. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, just to answer to Paul, this already exists in some place, maybe it has to be upscale, but for instance in Flanders you have this kind of platform where you can uh, find eco-design uh, 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 activities and, and demonstration. I think that it, it's really something that is common, but building bridges uh, between the various stakeholders and the, the various types of, of, uh, of people engaged is something that is key. And public authorities, especially at local and regional level, uh, have the possibility to really uh, facilitate this right. system. And maybe the stakeholder platform is one of the ways of creating a space for uh, those bridges to be built. Any more? Yes. Creating visibility of uh, regular wave streams so and connecting these to innovators. I love it. Yes, it took, it took a moment because it was so short that maybe the simplest things are the most profound. Great. I hope someone's, yeah, someone's noting these down, aren't they? This is, a, this is a, no less than a manifesto we're coming up with here. Considering that the amount of elements and materials we're using is increasing every day and the difficulties of recyclers to process who knows what, mm, carbon fiber, whatever in the future, I think we should have some sort of authority that allows innovation to, to thrive, but actually secures that the new materials put in the market fulfill some criteria that at least should be recyclable today or recyclable in the future. Because today, it's, it's everything is allowed, which is great for innovation, is not good for recycling, is not good for the environment, so we need some sort of authority that authorizes new materials, new polymers to enter the market after some fulfilling some conditions. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe, not overall, but something I've heard also is, you, you mentioned, uh, it is that you know, wow, there are so many dimensions to this, and uh, how about seeing, let's have, a, let's have a sector competition. Which is the sector that's going to get a grip and do it? So is it going to be construction? Is it going to be coffee? Is it going to be, I don't know what? You know, maybe get a sector, instead of thinking reasons, reasons why not, let's be the sector that made the change. And others may just come along thinking, Okay, yeah, that's good. So maybe, maybe we don't try and take the whole world, but maybe the, the alliance of the willing could be an idea. One more idea. <laughs> well, I have to say, I think we've had about six ideas, which if we managed to work those through would be game changers. We're almost at our end, and I, I really just wanted to do, offer the floor just um, um, uh, to a couple of people, maybe two or three people, just to make some uh, comments. First of all, uh, you know, Kesutis, uh, day in, day out, you're trying to make sense of all this, help thoughtful policy making, creating the, the frameworks, the incentives, the regulations, dealing with all the stuff. Um, I just wonder two things, maybe something you take from from this encounter around this circular table, uh, and maybe just a final message you'd like to pass back in that might uh, energize and inform uh, our working, uh, or maybe our attitude and our partnership with the European Commission. So maybe a couple of comments. First of all, what do you, what do you take from today? Well, uh, I, I don't want to, let's say, sound arrogant, but I think what they've heard it really uh, testifies and uh, confirms that we are on the right thinking path. The only uh, thing that we would need is uh, for enough political mandate and the courage to take it all forward. Now, looking back in, I think, 1947, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that uh, this earth provides uh, enough uh, for the need, but not enough for the greed. Um, and I think that's precisely where we are right now that we've uh, accumulated around ourselves so much that it can be uh, put back into the economy that it would be a sin uh, not to do it. But for the less metaphysical ones, and those that uh, uh, really are after profit, and that's absolutely fine by me as well, 
the one um, area where we need to do a lot more of that is the consumers themselves. Uh, we know, yes, it's true that price still is the driving um, uh, force, but now consumer becomes a lot more sophisticated and all our constant surveys through Eurobarometer and elsewhere show that uh, people care about more than just the price. So what we will do is try to satisfy that need, that quest for, uh, for more information, for better information, so that the consumer really is, again, the king uh, of the market and tells the producers that they want better things than up to now. Okay, thank you very much for that. I just want a short word from uh, Bart and, and Daniel. You're in sense you've been the inspiration behind this meeting. Is there either one thing you take from it or you'd like to throw a, a thought into the pot? Daniel first? No, it's not Bart, but <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, no, it's no, a confusing. It's, it's, it's I, I, I think you a very modest view and closing the loop like, like our uh, event is called like. Um, I think what is important is just that we have this ambition, that we are committed to it, but we also need much more um, activities around it and innovation around it. I think we, we got some, some, some good examples here, but more, more needs to happen. And the policy, because we, we are here in the European Parliament, and we, we need to look also at the policy here in Brussels, and there is much more that can, can help us to this conducive uh, environment. And, and that's something, we have some ideas, there were a couple of others, and, and I'm sure we will, we will share them even more proactively after today. Great, thank you very much. Daniel. I think maybe just to reiterate something I said at the beginning, which is that um, this is absolutely something which has to be driven by collaboration between the private and public sector. And an, a, a good enabling framework is, is the gift, I think, that, that you, here in Europe can give to us as businesses uh, to enable us to deliver something which we will all be proud of you know, when our grandchildren and great-grandchildren inherit what we've created. Thank you. Brilliant. And maybe uh, our thanks once again to you for uh, hosting and enabling this to take place uh, in this setting. Uh, Deborah, I wonder whether uh, you've listened in to the conversations. Uh, does it give you renewed energy, hope, a whole new set of barriers and challenges? Mm -hmm. Where are you feeling as a result of our conversation? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I must commend to the organizers of, the, of this event for using the glass bottles, <laughs> not plastic bottles. So they show us uh, uh, environmental sensibility and, and business responsibility by preventing the waste, even if, uh, if they are recyclable. Uh, the second, uh, uh, I want to emphasize uh, maybe three important topics. First, one, first is uh, legal framework. Uh, it's very important for all uh, stakeholders, for the business, for the consumers, for the citizens, uh, for the startups, uh, and also for the member states. But uh, the true implementation of this legal framework is also important, not just on, on the local level, but also on the national level. And we are facing that uh, implementation of EU policies continues to fail in, in member states because of uh, some particular interest of uh, the national level politicians. The second one, uh, uh, ambitious, ambition. Uh, 20 years ago, we warned about the climate change and nobody believes, now only Trump don't believe in, in climate change. Today, we are warning about the marine littering and, and food waste as a huge problem. And uh, we are witnessing that uh, most of member states deny that is a, that is a problem. Even UN uh, have this in, in sustainable development goals for 2030. Uh, so we need to change something in this in, in to, 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 to uh, increase the level of ambition in member states. Uh, and I hope that we have a uh, lie in, in, in cities and regions which are more sensible on uh, uh, opinion of, of, of the public, opinion of the business, and, and they want to, to help them. And the third is the market. So we need demand when we speak, of, when we speak about the, the consumers. Uh, the consumers must recognize the, uh, why they need to buy uh, 
uh, these product, this, this products, and of course the financing. Uh, we heard VAT and some other, but there are also loan, loans and some other uh, new funds. Uh, I'm sure that startup can confirm that is today is very hard to get the green loan which can support their business. We need to change this, and of course, uh, if we need. Uh, 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 by the market, we can uh, show how we can boost the local jobs, which are important for fighting the unemployment, special unemployment of the youth, but also engage the elders in, 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 in this part. And everything which can contribute, any innovation which can contribute to reduce landfilling, to promote reusing, repairing of, 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 our, of our products, means that we'll be more resource efficient. And that is, should be the way how we deal with this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> so we are at an end of this uh, short but very rich uh, conversation. Could I uh, add my thanks? Um, particularly to the innovators. Uh, at a moment of innovation, uh, you're obsessed by innovation, markets, developing the business models, to take time out is no mean effort. But we hope somehow this will have been part of projecting your ideas, your values to a much wider world. So thank you to you very much. Could I also thank uh, the organizers of today who uh, have uh, managed to pull uh, together a great uh, set of people for a conversation. Could I thank our MEPs? This is the most ridiculous time constrained time of the year. So thank you for joining us for that. We've, well, that has been of huge value to us. All of you on the webcast, uh, we would like to thank you. Uh, we hope you've been able to follow the conversation. Um, uh, you may not have felt the full passion in the room, but I can tell you the temperature uh, is electric here. So we have got some new collaborations to develop after we finish. And could I thank all of you from organizations. This is such a long, challenging uh, journey, whether you're operating within the Euro Com uh, European Commission, you are part of a different association, zero waste or whatever, we uh, salute your passion for this agenda. We hope we meet again. Maybe one of the keys of today has, has been that we have sat around a circular table having an opening, uh, open listening conversation. It's been my privilege to be a part of that conversation with you. And if you stick with the circular economy, I'm sure we shall meet up again in the not too distant future. So thank you all very much uh, indeed. Thank you. <laughs>